So what was your question? Okay, 9 minus x squared. Okay, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 2, 2, 2. So r is this square, okay? r is the square with these corners, okay? And then f is this function. What am I supposed to do with these? Okay, so find the area over this region. Okay, the, the surface area. Okay, so then <coughs> first, first what we need to do is we need to recall that the surface area uh, element, right, the differential element is this. It is the partial of z with respect to x squared plus the partial of z with respect to y squared plus 1 like so, and then d a. So that's the surface area element, <coughs> the differential element. So then we have d s. How do we, how do we recover s from d s? With an integral, right? So then specifically that s is obtainable by the following double integral, the double integral over r of d s, like so. So then before you know, now that you can see that we're going, this solution is going to involve a double integral, the next thing you should do once you realize you're going to do a double integral is construct a sketch. So then let's make a sketch. <coughs> the sketch appears like so. Okay, so it is a square and it has one of its corners at the origin. So zero, zero, 0, 2, 2, 2, 0, 0, so like that. Okay, <coughs> so we're going to integrate over that region. So is this region horizontally simple or vertically simple? Both. Ah, both. So then it's sort of just up to us. Maybe, right? Okay. If it's up to you, then the answer is really actually is probably not up to you. So it, it is up to you, but I anytime you have a question that where it's up to you, that means that one way is easy and one way is difficult, or one way is possible and the other way is impossible, you know, some kind of game like that. Okay, at any rate, at any rate, the description of this will be uh, what? 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2, <coughs> and 0 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 2. So since x and y are both bounded by constants on left and right, that means that this is the simplest type of region you can possibly integrate over in rectangular coordinates. <coughs> okay. So then, let's write down two different versions of the double integral. So one of them can be the iterated integral, from x is 0 to x is 2, and uh, y is 0 to y is 2, of the square root of, now, partial of z with respect to x is negative 2x squared is 4x squared, like so. The partial of z with respect to y is 0, okay, and then 1 is just 1, so plus 1. Okay, so then, now, there's enough information for you to tell me what differential it is that I'm using here. What is differential am I, am I using? dy dx. Why am I using dy dx? Yeah, because y is the innermost integral of the iterated integral. So this is dy dx. Okay, alternatively, alternatively, we could say that we're going to do the iterated integral y is 0 to y is 2 x is 0 to x is 2 of this same thing, 4x squared plus 1 dx dy. So here's two possibilities. Which one do we like? I agree the first one is preferable. Okay, so why is the first one preferable?
That's correct. That's correct. This square root, right, this iterated integral, this square root term, the square root of all that blah, 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 that is constant with respect to y. So that's just a constant. Whereas, if you were to do this one, then the square root of 4x squared plus 1 dx, that's not constant. That expression is not constant with respect to x. Now, you could still do that, the second iterated integral. But you'd have to use what? A trigonometric substitution, right? From here, from here you could say, but I'm not going to, but I'm just going to say that this is what you could do, is you could say that u is, uh, let's think about this for a minute. No, you could say 2x is equal to the tangent of theta. 2x is equal to the tangent of theta. And then you could say that 2 dx is equal to the secant of theta squared d theta. Okay, so then the reason why you would do that is because 2x squared would, 2x all squared would be 4x squared, okay, and then plus 1. So that would be tangent squared plus 1, which is what? Secant squared. And then you could drop the square root and blah, 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 blah. I, ho I hope you remember this sort of thing from calculus 1. Yes? So, um, on the one on the left hand side, ah, yeah. Maybe you would. Let's look at it for just a moment. Ah, you may have to do it anyway. Well, let's see. Let's just carry it out. <coughs> Okay, so my suspicion, yeah, you may be right. My initial suspicion was that if we do the left one, we won't have to do any trig substitution, but maybe we will. So let's do this one, just for entertainment. So x is 0 to x is 2. So then my claim was that we should say that this is now the square root of 4x squared plus 1. y evaluated from y is 0 to y is 2 dx. <coughs> okay, so then this, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, this becomes the anti the integral from x is 0 to x is 2. The square root of 4x squared plus 1, and then multiplied by 2 dx. Yeah, so we're still going to have to do a trig substitution. Okay, so neither one of them is particularly nice. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So then I'll rewrite this just a little bit so that it looks, for those of you that had me for Calculus 1, you can remember how I would write it. So this is 2x squared plus 1 dx. So now I'll do the substitution that 2x is equal to the tangent of theta. So then 2 dx is equal to the secant of theta squared d theta. <coughs> Okay, so then now, before I go any further, I would always do this, right? So now I want to draw a triangle that corresponds to this substitution. So tangent, right, using the trig mnemonic, so ka toa, right? So tangent is opposite over adjacent. All right. <coughs> so here's a triangle with angle theta. Opposite, I'll say that the opposite is 2x, and what does that make the adjacent? 1, right? 2x is 2x over 1, so opposite over adjacent. This hypotenuse becomes, becomes the square root of 2x squared, which is 4x squared plus 1. So is it a coincidence that the square root of 4x squared plus 1 showed up again? No, no, that's not a coincidence. So furthermore, furthermore, how about... <coughs> How about the, the position that I've chosen the triangle? Is the triangle in the correct position? Is the triangle in the correct position? Ah, so now you have to remember things about when you're doing trigonometric substitutions and considering inverse trig functions and all that. Is this the correct position? Yes, it's the correct position. Why? Because, yeah, because x is between 0 and 2 x is between 0 and 2, which means, which means that 2x, 2x is between 0 and 4, right? So 2x is some quantity which is non-negative. If x could be negative, then, you know, I may need to consider drawing a triangle in the bottom right quadrant instead of, in the, top, instead of the top right quadrant. But at any rate, it doesn't matter here. So does everybody remember these things so far?
Okay, so then I will preserve the limits, just keep the limits the same for now. So this is now the uh, integral from x is 0 to x is 2. The square root of 2x squared plus 1 becomes <coughs> tangent of theta squared plus 1. And then this is multiplied by the secant of theta squared d theta. <coughs> OK, so then now. This tangent term becomes secant squared, okay, and then you compute the square root, and that becomes the absolute value of secant. But then we can drop the absolute value because why? Because it because this triangle exists in the first quadrant, and secant is positive in the first quadrant. So this is equal to the integral from zero to two. So this is one secant, and this is two more secants. So this is secant of theta cubed d theta. Okay, <coughs> so is everybody with me here? I assigned this question? Wow. <coughs> if I had done it beforehand, I probably wouldn't have. I think that secant cubed uh, is, w is one of the trick integrals. Yeah, you have to do integration by parts twice, I believe. Yeah, that's great. So, instead of doing that... <laughs> isn't that great? I'm going to take... This one was on the exam. I'm going to take it off. No, no, no. I'm just kidding. It wasn't, it wasn't on the exam. All right. So, let's... Okay, so le let's focus for just a minute. Okay, so I'm looking for this one in the table. Okay, integration by parts. What section is that? That's six point. <laughs> well, I mean, I could sit here and try and work it out, but uh, integration by parts. No, 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 no. I know what integration by parts is. No, I'm looking for the, the antiderivative of secant cubed. No, I don't want to do it. Ah, where is it? <coughs> Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Integration by substitution inverse first order Ah, 8.2. 527. Yeah, I'm aware that many of you know, are good friends with Mr. Alpha. Okay, so here we go. So this is, this is the antiderivative of secant cubed. Okay, so then x is... And so no more, no more of this. Now it will be... It will be one half secant of theta tangent of theta. Okay, and then plus one half the log of the absolute value of secant of theta plus tangent of theta. Okay, and then this will be evaluated between x is 0 and x is 2. Okay, great. Okay, so there's the, so this, you know, this, I looked this up. Alternatively, you could have used integration by parts twice and solved for the original integral, and then you would have found this. Okay, and it would have been a significant feat on your part. Okay, so then, <coughs> now what? I need to change it back to x's, right? Because currently, currently the evaluation bar is in terms of symbol x, but the expression in is in terms of symbol theta. So we need to convert these things back to, back to x's. 
Okay, so I'll copy the triangle down here just so we have, a, have it to look at. Okay, so this one was 2x, this one was 1, this, this one over here is the square root of 4x squared plus 1. Okay, so then this will be, I'll factor out that 1 half, so 1 half. Now the secant of theta, well that's 1 over cosine and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, so this is the square root of 4x squared plus 1 over 1, right, that's hypotenuse over adjacent, and then tangent is 2x, and then plus log of absolute value of secant, so this is again going to be the square root of 4x squared plus 1 <coughs> plus tangent, so then 2x in absolute value like so, and then this is evaluated from x is 0 to x is 2. Okay, so then now this one half, and now I can start plugging in. So then the first thing, 4 times 4 is 16 plus 1 is 17. So this is the square root of 17 multiplied by 4 plus the log of the square root of 17 plus 4. And I drop the absolute value because that thing is positive. And then minus. Okay, so now you evaluate at 0, so this will be, what, 0, and then plus the log of 1 plus 0, so the log of 1, which is 0. Okay, so then altogether, it will be, uh, what, 1 half multiplied by 4 square root 17 plus the log of the square root of 17 plus 4. What a wonderful homework question. <coughs> Great. So any question about that one? <coughs> Trig substitution. Right? It exists. Okay. <laughs> it's uh you know, personally my feeling about trig substitution is that's why we invented machines. Right? <coughs> Humans are good at reasoning out these things. Machines are and they're good at programming machines to carry out these things. Right? We don't dig ditches with our hands. <coughs> we build machines that dig ditches. Okay. So any other questions? Okay. So now we move to section 8.8 .8 for just a brief uh, reminder of something. So this is called improper integrals. And there is actually one of these on the take-home quiz, <coughs> an integral which is improper, though you may not know it by that name yet. So that's interesting that the name of this thing is improper integrals. So that should bring to your mind that, oh, is there a proper integral? Are some of them improper? What does that mean, that they don't dress properly or that they use impolite language in, in mixed company? No, 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 right? So it means something else. So. <coughs> Here, let's do an example of an improper integral. Okay, so then how about this? The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. So let's try and imagine, what could this, what could this even mean? Right, what could this even mean? So in a sense, geometrically, this has to mean, if it means anything, if it means anything, notice that 1 over x squared, well, that's a positive function between 1 and infinity. So it's positive in there. So if I indicate the bound x is 1 here, and then I draw the function 1 over x squared, you know, and it goes on forever, what could possibly be meant by this? What is its meaning? Ah, it's the area between 1 and infinity. So it is, it is all of this area, and it goes, it goes all the way to the right. OK? 
Okay, so then my my drawing is finite, but that's because I'm a you know finite person and all of that. So then this area extends infinitely far to the right. So then now this, strictly speaking, is not the same kind of thing that we've already dealt with. Right, so in calculus one, we considered if you have a positive function between two finite numbers, a and b, then the integral from a to b, well, that represents the area under the curve over the axis between a and b. So now what I'm saying is, okay, I let b run off to infinity. Okay. So let's try and, let's try and give meaning to this. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the following. Define. f of b <coughs> as the as I'll write it like this as f of b equals the integral from 1 to b of 1 over x squared dx and this is for b greater than 1 okay but but less than infinity Right, so b is now some finite number. So then geometrically, <coughs> geometrically, what this is, is this is now the picture, <coughs> this picture. Oop, not that. Okay, so I still have a fence at x is 1, but now I have another fence at a finite position, x is b. Okay, so then here's the function 1 over x squared. Goes on forever. And then what is the meaning of f of b? It's just this finite area, right? This little bit. It doesn't go on forever. It's just between 1 and b. Okay, so does everybody see that this is related to but, but distinct from the previous thing where I said I let b go all the way to infinity. Okay. <coughs> so then let's compute this this integral. Then f of b, well that's equal to the integral from 1 to b of x to the negative 2 dx. Okay, so then we can we can evaluate that. That's x to the negative 1 divided by negative 1 evaluated from 1 to b. Okay, so then this is <coughs> this is uh, negative 1 over x evaluated from 1 to b. Okay, and then after plugging in and rearranging, you get that this is 1 minus 1 over b. Okay, so that's f of b. Okay, and the important the thing I want you to realize here in this example is that this, right, one minus one over b, that's how much area is in there. One minus one over b for any for any b greater than one that you select. Now what I'm going to do is I is we've done the following. I said okay, let's let's have a fence post at a finite position b. Now, if we're going to try to assign meaning to letting letting b go all the way to the right, we need some mathematical concept that describes letting b go all the way to the right. Ah, a limit, right? A limit. So then, <coughs> so then, now we're going to compute the limit. We're going to compute the limit as b goes to infinity of f of b, which is the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over b. So now what is the limit of 1? It's 1, right? <laughs> 1 doesn't do anything as b is going to infinity. It just stays 1 all the time. So what is uh, the limit of 1 over b as b goes to infinity? 0. And so 1 minus 0, that's just 1. So then this, the answer to the to the question, the response is that the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx, well, that's 1. The answer is 1. Because 
what we said is that this is actually going to be interpreted as the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to b of 1 over x squared dx, which is 1. So then now, the reason for this, the reason that things have to be so carefully uh, cared for is because of the following. Recall that the integral the integral is defined in terms of a limiting procedure. Okay, so then the way it goes, like in, exa in this case where you have a positive function, then it's understood to be an area. Then we take all those little rectangles, we chop up the area underneath it, we estimate it with rectangles, and we say, ah, here's an estimate, now we're going to let the number of rectangles become infinite, where the, the width of the largest, of the widest rectangle is going to zero. So you're computing a limit. Right? The integral procedure is a limit. Okay? And then, after doing the integral procedure, which is a limit, then we compute another limit. Then we say, now we're going to let b go to infinity. So first we say, okay, we're going to chop this up into rectangles, and we're going to let the width of the rectangles go to zero in limit. And then after that, we're going to let b go to infinity in the limit. So there's two limits, and they have to be done in this order. They cannot be done in another order. This is an example in math where the order of things truly matters. Right? You cannot, generally speaking in mathematics, switch the order of limits. Okay? That, generally speaking, is not legal. Right? So then switching the order of things in an operation can give you quite distinct results, like pants and underwear. Right? Underwear and then pants, that's the usual way. Pants and then underwear, that's a totally different way. Right? That's not the way we, we usually take in this part of the country? Fine. Okay. <coughs> I'm not moralizing, I'm just saying that it's different, right? <coughs> okay, so then now, there is, another, there is another case where we said you could switch the limits recently, very recently, so who knows? Who can connect all of these dots? Starts with F. Fubini's theorem, ah, so he got it, right? Fubini's theorem says that a double integral, the double integral itself is a single limit procedure. Right? It's one limit. Then Fubini's theorem says that you can split this into an iterated integral in one of two ways. And if you can split it in both ways, then they are equivalent, which means that doing this iterated integral is the same as doing that iterated integral. And because it's an iterated integral, first you perform one integral and then another, that means you compute one limit and then another. So Fubini's theorem, that's another case where you can switch the order of, of limits. Okay, but generally speaking, you can't do it. So any question about this example? So how much area is under here? One. That's how much area is under there. That's interesting, isn't it? One area is under there? <laughs> okay, so let's do another example. So now, this one, the example that I just did, in fact, I'm just going to copy it. Okay, I'm going to make a copy of it, cut and paste. Okay, so I'll go to the next page. <coughs> okay, now the example that I'm going to do is I'm going to take this x squared and just make it 1 over x. Right, so instead of 1 over x to the 2, I've made it 1 over x to the 1. Right, and, you know, my ability to draw, <laughs> I can't even really uh, draw the difference between them, honestly. Okay, so then it will look like so. <coughs> okay, so again, I'm... Right, we want to compute all of this area. The area between 1 and infinity. So we're going to do it in exactly the same procedure. We're going to say, well, I'm going to compute... I'm going to define... f of b is what? What is it? The, yes, the integral from 1 to b of 1 over x dx, right? Which is to say that I put some finite fence post, right? Like this fence post right here. <coughs> okay, and then we're just concerned with the finite area between 1 and b. Okay, so then let's go ahead and evaluate uh, f of b. This will be, uh, what is the what is the antiderivative of 1 over x dx? 
log of x. So specifically log of absolute value of x. Okay, and this is evaluated from 1 to b. So then now b, we are giving its definition to be greater than 1. Okay, so then now log of b, since b is greater than 1, has what sig in? Positive, right? And b is itself is positive, so I can just drop that absolute value. So this is the log of b minus the log of 1. Okay, now what is the log of 1? 0. So this is the log of b. So this is what f of b is. Okay, so any question about that? So, so the integral, the question, the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx, well, this should be the limit as b goes to infinity of f of b, which is to say it is the limit as b goes to infinity of the log of b. And what is that? What does log do as its argument goes to infinity? It goes to infinity. Ha, so wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What would that be, what is that saying? The area is infinite. There's an infinite amount of area in there. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <coughs> We did, we did the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared, and we found that there was 1. Not like a million, or a billion, or some other number that you think to, to be very large. 1. That's how much area was in there. And we changed it from 1 over x squared, 1 over x to the 2, we changed it to 1 over x to the 1. That's all we did, and then it became infinite. An infinite amount of area in there? Well, that's a fact. Okay? <coughs> it's a fact. So then this, should, this is one of the striking examples where uh, you know, computing limits can give you, a non to a human, a nonsensical result, but this is in fact the case. Right, so the problem that's happening here is that most human intuition okay, requires finiteness to actually hold true. Right? The problem here is that we have an infinite, um, an infinite extent, so strange things can happen. Okay, so any question about these two examples? Okay, so then another example that I probably already said in class concerning infinite and intuition being broken is Hilbert's Hotel. Did I already mention that one? Right, so then you have Hilbert's Hotel as a hotel room that has infinitely many rooms that are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to infinity. Okay, and it, it always has a vacancy. Right? So then, even if you go in and, and there's someone in every single room, and you say, you go to the, to the hotel manager, Mr. Hilbert, and you say, do you have a room for me? And he says, sure, sure. He just picks up the phone call on the loudspeaker and announces to all of the members, everyone move down a room, and the first room is open. Okay. So if a million people show up, he just says, move down a million rooms, and the first million rooms are open. What if infinitely many people show up? Everybody take your room, multiply it by two, and that's your new room number. Now all of the odd rooms are open. And infinitely many people can come in. Right? This is, of course, entirely different if you have a hotel with like a hundred rooms and they're all full. Then can someone show up and there's a room open? No, it doesn't work that way. Right? That's because that's a finite case. In the infinite case, a lot of things get broken. So now, we're going to make a remark about the p-integral. So this is the main reason why we're doing this section at all, the p-integral. Okay, the p-integral is this specific case. The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx. So then the, the previous two examples are examples of a p-integral. Okay, so the first one was with p as what? 2, and the second one was with p as 1. Okay, so then now, <coughs> there, are a few there are two cases we need to consider. Okay, there are two cases we need to consider. So the first case is if uh, p is 
greater than 1. <coughs> okay. Let's consider the case that p is greater than 1. Then we can define that f of b is equal to the integral from 1 to b of 1 over, of I'll say it like this, x to the negative p dx, like so. <coughs> x to the negative p dx. Okay, so then this will be x to the negative p plus 1 divided by negative p plus 1 evaluated from 1 to b, which can be algebraically rewritten as 1 minus p, uh, excuse me, like this, 1 over 1 minus p multiplied by 1 over x uh, to the p minus 1. Okay, and that's because <coughs> moving the moving the x to the negative p plus 1 to the denominator has the effect of multiplying the exponent by negative 1. So then this is evaluated from 1 to b. Okay, so then this is equal to 1 over 1 minus p and then eva multiplied by 1 over b to the p minus 1 minus 1. <coughs> Okay, so that's what f of b is. Okay, <coughs> now p minus one. So we're in the case we're in the case that p is some number greater than one. So p minus one, right? If I if I take some number greater than one and I subtract one, then the resulting number is greater than zero. Greater than zero. So notice that p minus one is positive. Okay, since p minus 1 is positive, you can now tell me what is the limit. The limit as b goes to infinity of f of b. Well, this p term, 1 over 1 minus p, that's constant with respect to b, so it's just a constant. Okay, this minus 1 is always a minus 1. But what is the limit of 1 over b to the p minus 1? It's zero. Zero. Okay, so then one over one minus p multiplied by negative one can be rewritten as one over p minus one. So then the result is that in the case if you are evaluating a p integral, a p integral and p is greater than one, then the integral from one to infinity of one over x to the p dx is 1 over p minus 1. <coughs> okay, so then it exists, and it is 1 over p minus 1. Okay, so then now tell me, does this agree with the first example that we did? Yes, because the first example we did was a p integral with p is 2, and 1 over 2 minus 1 is 1, which is exactly the answer that we arrived at. Okay. So now, p equal to 1, p equal to 1, we already did that example. That's the case of the integral from 1 to p of 1 over x dx, and then you get the log function, and then what do you determine? The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the, x to the 1 dx, well, that's infinite. Okay. Finally, if p is less than 1, if p is some number less than 1, <coughs> then the integral from uh, 1 to, we can define this, f of b is the integral from 1 to infinity of x to the negative p dx, and it is still equal to this expression, oh, the thing is crashing, ah! Can you believe that? Okay, so then <coughs> I'll just walk you through in words the rest of it and then write down the result after it finishes crashing. The result is that it also diverges in case. Okay, so then when is the case that it converges? The only time it converges? When p is greater than 1. Okay, good. <coughs> Come on, machine. Cooperate with me. Uh, not too bad. Okay, so then 
P is 1, diverges. P, uh, P less than 1, diverges. Okay, so then, as a result, we can say the following. So, the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx is equal to 1 over p minus 1 if p is greater than 1 and it diverges otherwise. Okay, so just a quick example. Silly example. So how about uh, the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over, and I just want you to tell me if it converges or diverges, 1 over x to the 1.000001. Zero 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 one dx. So does it converge? Well, that's pretty close to 1. I don't know. It's making me nervous. It's one. Ah, but it's greater than 1, right? Okay, this converges. Okay, then I can give you a, a similarly silly example on the other side, say 1 over 1 over x to the 0 0.99999. And let's make it like this. I'll make this last 9 repeating. So what about that? It diverges. And it diverges. Okay, so the truth of the matter is, I'm, not, I'm never going to ask you a question so simple as that. What's really is that's going to happen is that in a few lectures, we're going to be talking about something called series, and then you will be using the p-integral to make various determinations about the series, to say that, well, this series behaves like this p-integral, and this p-integral converges, so the series converges. Or, this series behaves like this p-integral, and this p-integral diverges, so the series diverges. Okay, so you won't, I won't ever give you a question like this directly, but you need to know when a p-integral converges and when it doesn't. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so let's do another example. <coughs> so here's a typical example of things gone wrong. <laughs> okay, so then how about, let's do this. The integral from 0 to 1 <coughs> of 1 over the square root of x dx. So now here, I claim to you that this integral is also not proper. This is a very misbehaved integral, bad integral. But it's not bad in the same way as the previous kind, right? The previous kind was bad because, because one of the limits was infinite. Right? We said we've got to go all the way to the right. Incidentally, going all the way to the left is just as bad. Okay. So what's wrong with this? Well, let's draw a picture. Let's draw a picture, because maybe drawing a picture will uh, help figure out what's going on. So then, we're just integrating between 0 and 1, so that's, that's good. And then, let's see, what does 1 over square root function look like? It looks like so. Right, it looks just like the other two examples that I've drawn. Okay, but what area is it that, that if, it, if this integral is referring to anything, what is it referring to? Right, all of this area, right, it goes all the way up. Okay, so then that that area, if it I if it is in fact an area, okay, goes it has extent that goes all the way up. So someone give me we can't do it like this. This is not a legal thing to do. So someone tell me something that is legal that we can do. <coughs> So, how about this? Is there a problem at x is 1? No, 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 no. No, x is 1 is okay. 
the problem is that x is zero. That's where the problem is. The problem is is that there's an asymptote there. And so that's no good. So then what we're going to do instead is we're going to say, all right, all right, all right. I'm going to integrate between the red and the green post. Right? And I'll call this one uh, b. Okay, so I'll say that this is x is b. And then I'm going to let x is b do what? Go to where? Go to zero. But specifically, it has to go zero from from the right, right? We can't approach zero from the left. That would not be a legitimate thing to do. Right? We have to approach it from the right. right? You can't be over here. Right? That would be even worse. <laughs> okay, so then you have to approach uh, zero from the right. So then specifically, we're going to say that, okay, we're going to, to define f of b is the integral from where to where? Not one to b b to 1 of, one of, I'll say it like this, x to the negative 1 half dx, right, because that's 1 over square root x, and then the b that we are using has to satisfy this, 0 less than uh, b less than 1, right, so that just means the b that we're selecting is between 0 and 1, as my drawing is indicating, okay, so then f of b this will be, uh, what, x to the 1 half divided by 1 half, evaluated from b to 1, which is 2 square root x evaluated from b to 1, which is, what, 2 minus 2 the square root of b? <coughs> 2 minus 2 square root b. So, the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over the square root of x dx if it has any meaning at all, has to mean the following. It has to mean the limit as b goes to 0 from the right of f of b, which is to say I'm taking the area between the red and green fence posts and then letting the green fence post go to 0 from the right. Okay, so then this would be what? What is, I'll write this down, so the limit as b goes to infinity, or not infinity, 0, from the right of 2 minus 2 the square root of b. So what does 2 do? It goes to 2. Okay, great. What does the square root of b do as b goes to 0 from the right? 0, so then minus 0, so this is 2. So what is the conclusion here? That the integral, its value is 2, and the area between 0 and 1 is 2. That's how much area is in there. Okay, but, you know, I gave you, I'm not going to do it, but I'm just going to tell you that I gave you one that converges, right, to 2. I can make it to converge, I can make it converge to anything I want, right? So if I wanted it to, to converge to 10, then I would just take this integral and multiply it by 5, and then it would converge to 10. Okay, great. So then now, I gave you an example between two finite bounds that nevertheless was improper, and I made it converge. Understand that I can make it diverge, no problem. Okay, so does everybody see the way this goes? So now let's try one more. One more to try and tip you off to some of the games that are played. <coughs> okay. So here is a typical example. The ones in the book are so boring. Here we go. Okay, so the integral from 1 to 2, the integral from 1 to 2 of 2 divided by, uh, not 1 to 2, excuse me, sorry, 1 to 3. The integral from 1 to 3 of 2 divided by x minus 2 to the 8 thirds dx. Okay, <coughs> so let's do this wrong. Okay, I want to do this entirely wrong. Okay, so then I'll say that, well, I could rewrite this as the integral from 1 to 3 of 2 multiplied by x minus 2 to the negative 8 thirds 
dx, then I can say that u is equal to x minus 2, du is equal to dx, u evaluated at 1 is negative 1, u evaluated at 3 is 1. So then this is, this is the integral from uh, negative 1 to 1 of 2 multiplied by u to the negative 8 thirds, du. <coughs> So this is what, 2, negative 8 thirds plus 1 is negative 5 thirds, so u to the negative 5 thirds divided by negative 5 thirds evaluated from negative 1 to 1. So then this will be negative 6 over 5 multiplied by 1 over u to the 5 thirds <coughs> evaluated from negative 1 to 1. Okay, so the negative 6 over 5, and then this is what? 1 minus negative 1, so then this will be 2, so then this will be negative 12 over 5. And this is entirely wrong. All of this computation is wrong. Okay, what's wrong with this? <laughs> what's happening at 2? It has an asymptote at 2, right? It has an asymptote at 2. And the integral procedure that you have does not work across asymptotes. It doesn't. Okay, so then if you look at this picture, <coughs> mm, let's say like this. Okay, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things wrong with this. So then let's, let's look at just, just how much difficulty there is. So then at 2, there's an issue, right? There's an asymptote. We're integrating between 1 and 3. So then now 2, 2, that's a positive quantity. And then x minus 2, 8 thirds, that means compute the cube root and then raise that to the 8th power. And then raise that to the 8th power. So then now 8 is even. So x minus 2 raised to the 8 thirds, that's positive. Right? It's a positive quantity. <laughs> so, you know, this function looks something like this. Oh, not, not like that. Like this. Right? Some sort of volcano or whatever. Okay, so then now, if there is an area, <laughs> right, of this volcano thing, then what do you think the SIGN should be? Probably positive. What did we get? Negative 12 over 5? <laughs> that should tell you something, right? That should tell you that something you did was not legitimate. <laughs> okay, the thing that's not legitimate is you, you in, we integrated just right across the asymptote. Okay, <laughs> so, so now, I'm going to give you the answer, but in a moment. So I'd like to say this, just as a matter of test-taking strategy. Okay, but not on the coming exam, but just on the final exam and whatever. Okay, we always give some kind of improper integral on a quiz or on, a, on a, an exam or whatever. Okay, and often, not always, but often we choose some innocu innocuous looking one like this. Right, we don't, we don't blatantly advertise that it's improper by, by making one of the limits infinity or making one of the endpoints an asymptote. Sometimes we just give you an integral and we just put an asymptote somewhere in there. Okay, like this one, right? <laughs> Between 1 and 3, well, here's an asymptote at 2. So does everybody see the game? Right, the way the game is played. I'm not saying it's a fair or a good game. I'm just saying that that's, that's how it's played. Okay, <coughs> so the only way to proceed on this question is as follows. So this is x is two, uh, 1. This is x is 3. This point here is x is 2. So what we're going to do is we need to split this up into two different integrals, both of which are improper in the same way that they were in the previous case. So we can say that this is the integral from 1 to 2 of 2 over x minus 2 to the 8 thirds dx plus the integral from 2 to 3 of 2 over x minus 2 to the 8 thirds dx. 
Okay, so both of these are improper in the same way one of the previous ones w was improper. The previous one, 1 over square root of x, was improper because at the limit at 0, it had an asymptote. Both, it, both of these are improper because at one of the limits, 2, this one has an asymptote, 2, this one has an asymptote. Okay, so then now, in order, in order for this to actually exist, both of these integrals have to converge. If either one of them doesn't converge, then it, all bets are off. Okay, so then now, this is another thing that I would never do on an exam, but possibly on a take-home quiz, is give you an integral that has to be split up into like five or six different integrals. You know, m make it have limits going to infinity, a couple different asymptotes, so you've got to break it up into several pieces. If just one of those pieces diverges, then the whole thing diverges. So the optimal strategy in such a question is to look at all of the pieces and say, uh, that one. That one, I think, is going to diverge, so I'm going to test it first. Because if you, if you split them into five pieces and the first one you test, that one diverges, you don't need to test any further. The whole thing diverges. Okay, yes? So, I mean, you could do an integral over the whole line, like from negative to infinity to positive infinity. Is that what you're asking? Ah, so, so can you have a, yeah, so can you have a canceling positive infinite area and, an, and a negative infinite area and then they add together and cancel and the answer is no. No, you can't do that, right? So then, so there's severe and significant problems with trying to define such a thing and it's universally panned among mathematicians. No, there is no such thing. <coughs> Okay, good. So then now, mm, we can do this one, for example, right? either one of them. So then I'll define f1 of b equal to the integral from 1 to b of uh, 2 x minus 2 to the negative 8 thirds dx. And I'll say that this b that I'm choosing is 1 less than b less than 2. Okay, so specifically what that is saying, what that's saying is I'm making this selection. I'm saying that I'm going to choose a B right here. Okay, then I'm going to compute this area, and then I'm going to let B go to 2 from the, right, uh, from the left. Okay, and see what happens. <coughs> okay, so then after some considerations, since we're trying to hurry, so F1 of B after you actually perform the integral will be... Oh, I guess I'm just going to have to do it. I can't see it in my head. Okay, so then this will be <coughs> 2 multiplied by x minus 2 to the negative 5 thirds and then divided by negative 5 thirds <coughs> evaluated from 1 to b. So this is... Uh, so negative 5 thirds this negative 6 over 5 and then 1 over x minus 2 to the 5 thirds evaluated from 1 to b. <coughs> so then this will be negative 6 over 5. And then what? 1 over b minus 2 to the 5 thirds minus 1. So this will be negative 1 to the 5 thirds. So then that's minus negative 1. So then plus one. Okay, so that's f1 of b. So then what is the limit as b goes to infinity, or not b goes to infinity, b goes to 2 from the left <coughs> of f1 of b. So what is 1, so this negative 6 fifths, it's just negative 6 fifths. This 1 is just 1. The real question is, is what does this thing do? What does 1 over b minus 2 to the 5 thirds do as b goes to 2 from the left? So what will b minus 2 go to? 0. So this will be 1 over some kind of 0, some variety of 0, something very close to 0. So this, <laughs> this term diverges. Right, so then this just diverges. So then what we're saying here is that this piece, this piece on the left, it diverges. So do I need to consider the piece on the right? No, nope, it diverges. It doesn't matter. If one of the pieces diverges, the whole shebang diverges. So then the conclusion is, 
So the integral from 1 to 2, uh, uh, 1 to 3 of 2 over x minus 2 to the 8 thirds dx diverges. So any questions about this one? <coughs> no, you don't need to make any specific considerations. It just diverges. Okay, <coughs> so any question about this? Okay, so now we need to move on to something else exciting. Ah, but before I do, I want to foreshadow something that I'm probably going to give you on the take-home quiz because it's quite interesting. Okay, so then this example is called Gabriel's Horn. <coughs> okay, so then in various cultural situations there's a uh, a character named Gabriel and he's supposed to hail the end of the world right the world is going to end according according to certain cultural uh, esteems and the way he's going to signify that the end of the world is coming is by blowing a horn a trumpet right and it's supposed to be very loud everyone will know and so there's this horn and it's very significant in certain cultures and <coughs> I'll just leave it there but now what I'm going to say is that let's consider a horn that is to mathematicians called Gabriel's horn. So specifically, I'm going to take f of x is 1 over x, f of x is 1 over x, between x is 1 and infinity, and then I'm going to rotate about the x-axis. Okay, so then here's x is 1. <coughs> okay, so then something like so. So there's 1 over x, and then it goes off this way, but I'm not talking about that part that goes up. I'm just talking about the solid part. Okay, now I'm going to rotate this about the x-axis, right, like this. Okay, so then I'm going to perform this rotation. Okay, so then it looks something like so. Okay, so then if I was to try and be an artist, you know, then maybe it would look like this. Right, so this horn goes infinitely far to the right. Right, which perhaps is suiting for a horn that's supposed to signify the end of the world. Okay, <coughs> so now here's something interesting about Gabriel's horn that you're going to show. So you're going to show these things. I'm not going to I'm not going to show them to you. You're going <coughs> to show them. The volume of Gabriel's horn <coughs> is pi. It's pi, which means that in a sense, if these were measured in, you know, certain certain units, then you could fill this you could fill this whole horn with a little bit more than 3.14 gallons of paint. Right? You could just you could set it up and then just dump the paint in 3 3.14 gallons of paint, fill it to the top. Okay? Good. Here's another thing that you're going to demonstrate is that the surface area of Gabriel's horn is infinite. So someone tell me why these two statements seem that they cannot be in accord. Yeah, there's a finite volume but infinite surface area, but some people still ha it hasn't struck them why this seems unreasonable. So let's back up just a minute. Has anyone ever painted anything? Have you ever painted anything? If you look on the side of the bucket, it says 
that this is good for 300 square feet or whatever. One gallon can cover 300 square feet. So the surface area of Gabriel's Horn is infinite, so how many gallons of paint would it take to cover it? An infinite amount. It would take an infinite amount of paint to paint Gabriel's Horn. But you could fill it with a little bit more than 3.14 gallons? That's disturbing, right? <laughs> That's disturbing. So then we should be able to fill it with less than four gallons of paint, but nevertheless, no finite amount of paint would suffice to paint it all. <coughs> so then this, this is an example of human tui intuition is breaking down because this shape doesn't have a finite extent. Right? It, goes, it goes on infinitely. There's no shape, right, that could have this same property. Okay, if, well, okay, I'll back that up. There are other shapes, but we'll, we'll not consider them. Uh, this is strange. It should be strange to you. Okay, <coughs> good. So any questions about this before we move on? Okay, so then now we're in section 9.1, which is called uh, Sequences. Okay, so then chapter 9 is the last chapter that we will deal with in this class, okay? And this is the last third of the semester, and I'll say this just as a word of warning or caution or whatever. There are three exams in Calculus 2, the first one which you took, the second one which you will take in a few days, and the final exam. Of all of those, statistically the performance is worst on the final exam, so students typically their response is to say that this chapter, chapter 9, is the hardest chapter. Well, I don't know if that's a fact, but it is a fact that the, the grades are lowest on the final exam. Not for everyone, not for every individual, but as a population, it's a fact. Okay? So that's just a word of caution and information to you. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so then, specifically, this is the definition of a sequence. A sequence, <laughs> A-N, right, so then the sequence name is A, and th it has an index called N, is a function. From the natural numbers, natural numbers, to the real numbers. Okay, which is to say <coughs> that a sequence is just, it's a very special kind of function. You already know about functions from reals to reals. So an example from reals to reals is f of x is x squared. Okay, so then now what I'm saying is, is we're going to deal with functions, but they're only defined for natural numbers, which is to say positive integers. Okay, so then it would be like me giving you a function where you could evaluate it at 1, 2, 3, 1 million, and 47. All of those places are integers, but you couldn't <coughs> evaluate it at 4.5. That's not an integer. You can't evaluate it there. You can only plug in integers. Okay, so then this is, in a sense, less, a less diverse group of things that you already know. Okay, so to make this clear, we'll do a couple of examples just to write things down. How about a n is... Uh, 1 over n. Okay, <coughs> so you could write down the first several terms of, of a n. So then, what's the first term of a n? 1, right? 1 over 1. What's the second term? 1 over 2, and then 1 over 3, and then it goes all, you know, 1 over k, and then goes on forever, right? There's infinitely many terms in the sequence. <coughs> Okay, another example, 2. How about bn? bn is, uh, let's think about this, the cosine of n pi. <coughs> the cosine of n pi. So let's write down several terms of bn. So what's the first term? The cosine of pi, and what is the cosine of pi? Negative 1, good. Okay, what's the second term? 
cosine of 2 pi. So what's the cosine of 2 pi? 1. one. OK, the next one is the cosine of 3 pi. What's that? Negative 1. Negative one. And then the next one? 1. And then negative 1. And then 1. And then negative 1. Right, so then generally, the kth term of the sequence, you could, re you could write it as so. It is uh, what? Negative 1 to the k. Negative 1 to the k. So then that's important. <coughs> that's important because what that tells you is that you can write bn in another way. You can say bn is negative 1 to the n. Okay, so then just like you can take a function and rewrite it in another way that's maybe more useful, here's another way where you can take a sequence, the cosine of n pi, and then write it in another way, and it's more useful, possibly. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so then how about another? Okay, so let's do one like this. So who, who can tell me what this one is? So I'm going to say that f of n plus 2 is equal to f of n plus 1 plus fn. And f of 1 is equal to 1, and f of 2 is equal to 1. So what is this one called? The Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence. So then there was an Italian guy named Fibonacci, and he came up with this sequence a long time ago, and it's named after him, which is why I wrote F for his name. So then now, how about what is f of 3? Well, according to the definition, that should be f of 2 plus f of 1, right? f of 2 plus f of 1. Uh, do we know what f of 2 and f of 1 are? Yeah, I told you they were 1 and 1. So this is 2. OK, great. So then how about f of 4? Well, according to the de definition, what f should that be? That should be f of, f of 3 plus f of 2. Right, and then I know f of 3, that's 2, and f of 2, that's 1, so this is 3. Right, and then f of 5, f5, that will be f4 plus f2, or excuse me, f4 plus f3, so then that will be 2 plus 3 is 5. Okay, then if I was to continue this, right, the next line is always the sum of the previous two lines, so this would be 8, 13, 21, and now I'm starting to get to the limit of my arithmetic abilities. Okay, so then it goes on. <coughs> okay, so there's a sequence. Okay, so you can define sequences analytically with a formula or recursively according to something like this. And we're out of time. So I'll see you on Thursday. <coughs>